I want to mention an opportunity that people in the Raleigh Durham Carborough Chapel Hill area have to hang out with us. We love our intro music performed by the Doug Largent Trio, and they will be playing in Carborough next week. The Doug Largent Trio, most well known for the intro music of Hello PhD, will be performing at the station in Carborough Sunday, October the 11th, 7 to 9 p.m. Daniel and I will be there at the station. If you want to come hang out with us, sort of a Hello PhD meetup, we will be there. That's probably trademarked. A Hello PhD <laughs> get together. <laughs> a gathering of Hello PhD uh, co hosts and listeners. If you'd like to come out and enjoy some tasty brews with us in person and enjoy the Doug Largent Trio, we would love to see you there. Five strikes and you're out. <laughs> Just like that game people play. <laughs> Sports ball. Sports ball. <laughs> Jeez. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week on the show, part two of our series exploring the highs and lows of postdoctoral training and how to make it better. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD episode 14. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we will explore the human side of science and life in the lab. Welcome back, Daniel. And for once, welcome back is actually meaningful because I am back from a trip. It's not just I'm back recording. You're back. I was holding down Hello PhD Studios by myself last week. You know, I felt so, you know, you did a great job being excited with your with your streamers and noisemakers <laughs> yeah. like, that reverberated through your empty room as you sat by yourself. Uh, it was surprisingly a weird experience to sit here and talk to myself yeah. uh, and trying to appear energetic and exciting. No, it was it was really fun and I enjoyed listening to the whole podcast. The interviews were great. Well we are we are glad to have you back on the microphone. And and you were not drinking anything last week. That was the big disappointment, I think. Yeah, you know, actually a couple people mentioned to me this week that they were disappointed that there was no beer on last week's show. I don't know. I just I don't like to drink alone. That's probably a wise idea. <laughs> so maybe we should drink twice the beer this week. We'll do it. Well we got a, a quite a big bottle today. Yeah, Dan. So, um, so this came from your trip. Yeah, I was I was up in Massachusetts. I was visiting some family, and I got really all around the Massachusetts area. I dipped my feet into Walden Pond and um, got to travel around Boston and Woods Hole and Cape Cod and places. But this is my brother's favorite beer. So he lives up in Boston, and uh, he said this. Is, I asked him for a beer recommendation from Massachusetts. Uh huh. This is the one we got, and this is. The Berkshire Brewing Shabadoo Black and Tan. Shabadoo Black and Tan. So I'm looking at the bottle, and every time I look at this bottle, I don't see Shabadoo. I see Sharknado. Okay. <laughs> That's the main ingredient. Did you realize that? <laughs> That's fantastic. I don't know, don't know why that is. Yeah. I actually have never seen that movie. It's, that, on, it's on my bucket list. That's how they bottle it. They <laughs> squeeze a shark. From the Sharknado into each bottle. This is actually, um, I think this is really hilarious. It's 33% porter. It's their, um, what is it, the Draymond's porter that they make. And 67% Hoosack Tunnel Amber Ale. And like, so it's a mixture. Yeah, it's it's, oh, it's a black and tan. Instead of floating, they're kind of mixed together. Yeah, you know, I I don't think I've seen a black and tan bottled before. This is a first for me. Well, Yingling makes it black and tan, so I feel a little offended that you're not aware <laughs> Actually, of Actually, you know what? I forgot about that. Yeah. So this is the second but black and tan in the bottle you, I've had. Yeah, they don't tell you the percentages. I don't, I don't, I'm tasting kind of like 33.3333% porter <laughs> and 66.66% ale. Yeah, I don't know what the significant digits on. Kind of round it up to me. I don't know. I taste a little bit more more precision there you know i will say this is pretty good this is delicious i see why your brother likes this yeah it's a nice dark color a little bit sweet what else are you getting off of it well i am i'm not a big porter fan a big porter stout well luckily this is just fan. one third porter well i know and i'm thinking this might be a good transitional gateway beer i mean the winter months are coming i feel like you know drinking porters and stouts works a little bit better for you in the colder weather. So maybe this will be a gateway beer to get me to the darker brews. Shabadoo. Shabadabadoo. I wonder where they came up with that. <laughs> Anyways, you, sir, uh, 
did did the lion's share of work last week. All of it, I would say. Yeah, so you were gone, but I was not resting on my laurels. I was very busy last week with Hello PhD stuff. Um, talked to eight different postdocs, and man, wasn't that great? I I loved it, and and here's why I loved it. Those people love their work. That was the first thing that stood out to me. I love to hear scientists who love science. Mm-hmm. They are they are doing what they are passionate about, and and that came across so clearly. It was it was really cool to hear them. Yeah, I mean across the board, really. When you know, when I asked the the postdocs what they liked most about being a postdoc, there was very little hesitation. It was the science, the ability to do science. And what that made me think about was really, you know, an impetus for wanting to to do this and really why we would want to improve the training culture in general. And that is so many people will go into science, maybe everybody, because they originally love science and research. Or the idea of it or some aspect. It's yep. true. And and sometimes when people fall away or kind of lose lose that love of science, it's not the science, but it's something with the environment. And so to hear all these postdocs who've been in the game for a long time say, you know what, I still love research, I still love science. Uh, I thought that was very heartening. Yeah, and I wasn't here last week to give my personal brand of uh, <laughs> color to this story. So why, let's let's look back. Let's take some of the feedback you got from these postdocs and, and try to put together the theme so that we have a more cohesive look at, at what postdoc life is in 2015. Yeah, I think that that's a great thing to do because – you know, due to time, we wanted to fit in as much of the, the postdoc interviews as we could last week. So kind of just left it, um, you know, left it there. So I think we'll really just take this whole episode and just break down a lot of the, the themes that, that came up last week. And and we're already on it. So first and foremost, um, when you said, what do you like about being a postdoc? I heard, I am no longer in classes. I am no longer... Uh, trying to to chase this carrot of a PhD. Um, but also, I'm not to that place yet where I'm a PI and I've got to worry about the the paperwork and the grants and the whatever. I get to go in every day, think of an idea, and pursue it. That, I heard that in so many of the different interviews. Um, it, it's, this, it's this like middle zone where you actually get to open up the engine and run down the track. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, you know, I can remember you know, starting my postdoc, it really is this kind of special time where, you know, the grad school's in the rearview mirror, you have the PhD, that's behind you. And, you know, you're not quite to the point of worrying about your next step yet. And you realize like my whole world now, my whole job is to do research. And, And often in a good situation, you know, you have a lot of autonomy as far as what you do and how you do it. You're confident. And, you know, the thing that I always thought was really great about being a postdoc all of those frustrations on your grad school project gone. It's yeah, a it, brand it's a new slate. world, blank slate. Tabla and, rasa, as we like to say, <laughs> if we're if we're etymological. I yeah. like that. That's a good. That is a good one. Uh, you know, the other theme that came up that I thought was really cool was, um, you know, one of the postdocs mentioned really having an intimacy with the data. Yeah, it was it was such an odd turn of phrase, but <laughs> so accurate. Absolutely. I mean, you were there with it. And, you know, this idea that once you're a PI, you're always going to be once removed from the data. And the postdoc is really the last time. It's just you and the data. You're designing experiments. You're carrying them out. You're doing the analysis. You're writing them up. And so really, it's all you from start to finish. And you just really can immerse yourself in the work. Well, and I liked that that the feedback was, let's say you didn't love the research you did as an undergrad, or let's say the PI was terrible, or let's, you know, whatever aspect of graduate school was not great for you, this is this is that new chance to start over and to do the thing that you are passionate about, not the thing that, oh, I, I got into the school, so I have to pick one of these labs in this department because that's where I applied and that's where I was admitted. Now, I mean, go apply anywhere, really. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the time you finish grad school, you know, you not only have a great idea of what you want to do, but you have a lot of information about what you don't want to do and what environments aren't the best for you. And so you really can go out there and and find a lab that really fits you, not just your research interests, but I think just the type of environment where you work well and a chance to really get a fresh start. Um, I think it can be a really invigorating time. And I think a lot of the postdocs we're expressing that. Yep. And, and, and the mastery they felt. I mean, this is like that 
we talk about this sense of flow when you're doing a thing you love and it's it's challenging but you also are able to meet that challenge and you kind of lose track of time that that is where we all need to aim when we're picking a career yeah i think that's totally true so um, those were the things the, the that was the post that was the bright side liked was, was, the was, side. was the science actually yeah. Uh, but that wasn't. Turns that's out. not all there is to being a postdoc. There were some some things that they didn't like. Be be pretty awesome if that was the end of the interview and everybody was happy all the I time, just right? Go in and the music plays and I do yeah. science all day and it's just this utopia of discovery. Yeah, and and so when you asked what they didn't like, um, one of the most common themes was it, it kind of related to that. I love I love doing this science, but one of the common themes that they didn't like was that it was such a temporary position. Yeah, it's it actually is sort of this odd position to find yourself in because at first you say, you know what, this is such a great thing. I can just come in, do research, I'm independent, make my own schedule, but it's not going to last. Yeah, it, so they're in a state of limbo, basically, and you can never be settled down as a postdoc, I think. Uh, this is a, a feeling they have, but but this is some, the same advice that you got when you were a postdoc. Yeah, I remember actually when I was a graduate student, actually, Dan, when we were first-year graduate students, the director of our program, I don't even know why we were talking about this, but uh, she was talking about the postdoctoral experience and her opinion, and this has stuck with me all these years, was, well, actually, she posed the question, when should you start looking for a job as a postdoc? Probably year four. Her answer was day one. Hmm. And what she was trying to impress upon us was that the goal of a postdoc is a transitional period. It's not an end goal. It's not a job, really. It's a um, it's a stepping stone to something else. And, you know, I really liked what I think it was Michael who said, you know, in grad school, the purpose is clear. You know, it's to get a PhD. That's what your end goal is, and everybody knows that. But as a postdoc, you kind of have some competing interests. And so, you know, for your mentor, you know, they're happy. You're a trained set of hands. Cheap labor. Yeah, like to hold on to you so you can get that one more paper out. You know, there's a few more experiments done to help out on the grant. But for you, you know, I think really the idea is to keep your eyes open on that next, or at least keep your mind set on that next transition point from day one and always be on the lookout. And that's so challenging and, and it's bittersweet because what we just talked about is you are hitting this peak in your career where you get to do the thing you love. And now we're asking you to try and find your way out of it immediately. Yeah. And, you know, I think what can happen and what does happen for a lot of postdocs is you do, you know, you do start out in this honeymoon phase of your postdoc in the first couple of years, but that can quickly turn sour as you get, you know, good into your three, four, five, and now suddenly you realize, okay, I have to make a step soon. I have to make a jump soon. I mean, as we heard um, from at least one of the postdocs, you know, now there are funding restrictions in a lot of cases that after five years, five and done, yeah, you're out. And so five strikes and you're out, <laughs> just like that game people play. <laughs> Sports ball. Sports ball. <laughs> Jeez. Um, so, you know, I think it is a balance and I think, I think time, it would be interesting to see stress of a postdoc or satisfaction with a postdoc over time. I do love a good time series graph. Well, and you know, um, you know, Sonia, one of the, the postdocs, we had kind of a range of, of how long these, these guys had been in their postdoc. Sonia was the newest um, to the postdoc position. And, you know, she actually, when I posed the question, what would you change? You know, she couldn't think of anything because she was actually... been there long enough to decide, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think she knew that... It wasn't always going to be that way, but at least in the first, you know, six months or so, it was a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, the newness of it and being out of grad school, I mean, all of these things add together to make it seem pretty sweet. Um, you know, we're going to talk about compensation at, at in the next section probably because it was, it was so comedic that everybody mentioned that. We'll get to that. But um, somebody mentioned Arrested Development. And, and great show. Great show, but also kind of a hard place to be in your life and i understood it this is this is i've been to graduate school so now i'm let's let's say you go straight through from college now you're 28 ish you get into a postdoc um maybe you haven't started your family maybe you've been living on your graduate student salary and not saving up for that mortgage um 
maybe you haven't even had the time really to meet that special someone that you wanted to settle down with. Mm-hmm. And and you've watched all your friends and people in your family. Your grandmother asks you every time you go home, like, really? You haven't met somebody? You're not... <laughs> you're still in school. Yeah. And, you and, and now you're at this place where you're a postdoc and you'd like to start doing those things, but you're 10 years behind on your, your savings plan. It's I think it's really tough. Yeah, I think that is really tough. I mean, you know, you look in the mirror. Most, most postdocs are, you know, in their late 20s, early 30s, and you know, one of the things that was mentioned is sometimes I think at that point you look around to your friends and your peers who did something else. They went to Wall Street and made $10 million <laughs> on day one. <laughs> is that a movie? Yeah, um, I think so. But yeah, you look around and see, okay, your friends who've been in the, the working world for, you know, a decade at this point, or even let's say your friends who went to professional school, dental school, med school, yep. pharmacy school, you know, yes, they paid to go to school for four years, but now they've been out for, you know, two, three, four years and are on their way. And here you are, you know, staring down the barrel of this, you know, kind of amorphous yeah. and that's time not gonna, frame. That's not going to affect everybody. I mean, um, you were married in graduate school, so it, people have different experiences, certainly. But it, but if you find yourself in that position, it can feel a bit isolating. And And you know, somebody else mentioned just the isolation of, of the postdoc experience because you are not part of a cohort of students. And I thought that was pretty compelling as well. You're, you're not, you're not your own entity that everybody holds hands and goes to classes together. Yeah, no, that's right. You're not all the incoming students in the cell biology department uh, because there's a, everybody's coming in and going out the, at the same time. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, one of the postdocs, I think it was Kate, who's in a large lab, mentioned that that was actually one, one nice part about you know transitioning into a larger lab for her postdoc was there were there was a sizable cohort of postdocs in that lab and so they That's formed great, yeah. some community amongst themselves but I do see how that can be hard especially if your university doesn't have an active postdoc association but you know even if if your university does have that it's really hard to establish those communities because postdocs are doing such different things on such different schedules and often are just geographically spread out across the campus in different places. Yeah. Is it considered bad form or weird if you're a postdoc and you go hang out with the grad students at the bar? Is that okay or is that weird? You know, I don't think so. I mean, I know in my lab when I was a postdoc, you know, we were, there weren't really those designations. I mean, we all hung out socially and, and had a good time. So, okay. But if you're if you're playing beer pong with the undergrads at the the Friday night, you know like, that that could party. That's probably bad. That could be a little weird. Okay, because um, I've seen that happen too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen faculty, but yeah, I know. We, yeah, we should have a whole show on the faculty who show up to the party. <laughs> so weird. Okay, um, we had we had one comment about the. Well, actually, we had a couple comments about the relationship with the PI changing. Um, so you're probably going to get less attention in most cases than you did as a grad student, which could be a good thing. Which could be a good thing, but but the comment was also made that it's not always clear what the PI expects from you. You know, we talk about a PI understands the process of graduate school training, and you've got prelims, you've got classes, and you get your dissertation, and you have a committee. But it's not always clear what they expect from a postdoc. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, that is going to vary from lab to lab. You know, I think, and this is an issue, I don't know if this came up specifically, but you know, especially postdocs who have the interest in staying in academia, there can be the very real um, issue with, you know, you want to start your own research group, your own lab, but then does that make you the number one competitor with your PI? And so I know I've had colleagues who have had that strain around the time they're ready to leave is suddenly the project they've worked to build, they're getting some friction about taking those things with them when they go on their job talks. And so, you know, I think a lot of these things, and some of this came up with a couple of the postdocs last week, was you need to really think about what your goals are. You need to really think about what you want out of your postdoc and where you think you want to go. And don't keep that to yourself. You should really be upfront with your potential postdoc mentors when you're going on interviews or at least seeking out people you might want to work for. Because these things are going to be important to you and they are going to come up. So if you're going to have a PI that's not supportive of something you want to do, how much better to find that out before you sign on the dotted line than two years into your postdoc? When they're 
complaining at you for taking the you know the antibody you made with you yeah or you know and uh, on a different note if they're not supportive of you going out and getting teaching experience but teaching is what you want to do um, but they're not you know they're not happy with giving you release time to go do that because maybe they didn't know that's something you wanted to do and maybe you would have chosen differently if you would have known up front that oh this environment is not a good one for me to seek out experiences i need to go do what i want to do Okay, so so this segues us into the how to make it better, and and what you're talking about here is um, really having clear expectations before you get to your postdoc lab. Make sure you know what you're getting into, and I think that's great advice. Yeah, do do your due diligence before you start your lab. Really, you know, I've seen so many grad students sort of do the postdoc by default, where you know, and I understand it too, having been through the process, I know you have too, leading up to dissertation time can be one of the most stressful times and you just, you're just trying to get it done, you're trying to get out and it can be hard to think about anything else and so sometimes you can come to the end of your graduate training and realize, wow, I haven't put a whole lot of thought into where I'm going next, I need to go somewhere else and you know, most and people... here's a nice limbo to get into. Yeah, yeah well and you know, most people can it's find... It's the default, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, you can find a postdoc. Yeah, makes right? a lot of sense. Um, but what you don't want to do is get stuck. And and I think this came up with some of the, the postdocs that they wish there are certain things they would have thought about in retrospect before they joined or when they were on the postdoc search. So I think really as a grad student, you know, you want to, I don't know, right, start thinking about that much earlier and, and really leverage your postdoc to get where you want to go. Um, Let's come back to that when we get to our specific advice for graduate students, although what you're talking about is really advice to postdocs. Um, the, the most common answer, obviously, for to make postdoc life better... More is, money. You mean besides the pay? You mean besides that? <laughs> over the, the and editing over. Was, yeah, top you know, there. That was really funny to me because it was almost like... Because uh, I actually, most of the postdocs, I gave them these questions ahead of time you know, to really think about what they wanted to say. And uh, it was interesting to hear how they framed that. Well, obviously the pay would be yeah. the main um, thing, but I don't even need to talk about that because yeah. we all know that. Uh, and Episode that's something we've, yeah, we talked about that. yeah, we've talked about before. And that was even one of the, uh, you know, main suggestions for biomedical research, improving yeah. it in general. Um, so hopefully there will be movement in that yeah, direction. You will hear that topic again, but they didn't just mention the pay. They mentioned the benefits. They mentioned retirement, insurance, child care. And it seems like it varies from institution to institution. Yeah, that was interesting to me. Um, you know, we had, I know at least one postdoc mentioned that they received uh, retirement matching from their institution. I They're, don't receive retirement matching. Uh, but I will say, um, and this this didn't make it into the, the interview, but he mentioned that often their postdocs got paid, their salary was a little less uh, paired with getting those benefits. So it wasn't necessarily yeah. as good as it sounds. It's the shell game of postdoc pay. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's then under shell number three. Oh, it's your salary. Well, but you know, then another postdoc mentioned, you know, where she was, they actually got childcare assistance and and retirement fund too. So, you know, maybe that's something to think about when you're looking for your postdoc um, is to realize that not all institutions recognize postdocs equally. And so there maybe are places you could go, all things being equal, um, you know, where you might actually get better support and benefits. So you might as well ask those questions early on in the game when you're doing your search. Yeah, and that is related to another very common theme that I kept hearing. And it's, it, it's bizarre, it's a little bit weird to me, but this theme of postdocs are not real people in the university environment they're not students they're not you know employees but they're this other thing and because of that they kind of fall by the wayside time and time again in area after area of of compensation and recognition and support it's like academic purgatory yeah but the statement you know somebody made the statement make postdocs more real and, I, and I, I get it, but I don't get it. So I realize why postdocs would feel frustrated about this because, you know, on one hand, they're feeling not very recognized by the institution where they work. But at the same time, this was a theme that came up. If you look at the major workhorse of the research enterprise at most institutions. You just heard him call you horses, postdoc. 
I think the who cranks the wheel was the term that was animals, used. Yeah. I mean, it's postdocs, right? I mean, postdocs, they're, they are the ones day in, day out. They're skilled. They're getting most of the work done. They're cranking out the majority of the papers, but they're not really being recognized for that. And we, we joked a couple of weeks ago, you know, you did this, this whole interview in support of postdoc appreciation week, but we joked a couple of weeks ago about postdoc awareness week. I wonder if that needs to be a thing. You know, yeah. ever, ever since we talked about that, I've been picturing postdocs like in cages with a Sarah McLaughlin song playing <laughs> over the back. <laughs> Somebody please be aware of these postdocs. I want to be a real boy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I think that's totally true. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what it would take to get there, to be honest. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see this as something coming down from the funding agencies, although maybe it could. I mean, it almost seems like at an institutional level, there needs to be, and, and it seems some institutions are doing this already, you know, more of a recognition of postdocs as an actual employment class. But, you know, along with that came another another frustration. Um, I know one of the postdocs specifically mentioned this, and this came up a couple of weeks ago on our podcast. What if you realize, I really do love doing science. You know, I've trained to work in the lab. I'm really competent at working in the lab. I'm skilled. And this is what I want to do. There are very few positions for you. You know, it's almost like you've trained your whole life to do this one thing. You do it well. You enjoy it. And now, the way the career path works, you're being told, well, you have to go find something completely different to do. Yeah, I will beat that drum until someone pays attention to it. it. It makes absolutely no sense the way we take the most talented and we force them out of the thing that they love. Yeah. How is that? How is that good for research? I don't. Oh, it's not, but, but nobody thinks about it. It's, it's the established structure. And so, you know, we've always done it this way. Let's keep doing it this way. Maybe it will change. And I think it will change because of the people you interviewed, the people who said, I am, I am experiencing this state of flow with my work. I am at my maximum potential, um, when when somebody recognizes, hey, let's put these people to work uh, doing the thing that they love, that's when it'll change. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And and you know, I feel you know, at least a little bit encouraged the fact that you know certainly we had postdocs talking about this, but you know this actually did make one of the consensus reports that was published in PNAS yep. a couple weeks ago. So people are starting to be aware of this. Probably because we talked about it. I'm sure we are. Uh, they pre-published a document knowing <laughs> that we were also going to jump on the bandwagon. We are giving a substantial signal boost yeah. <laughs> to these issues. Okay. So um, I think we've gotten through a lot of that. Um, let's talk about the advice for graduate students because uh, this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is the, I'm looking back at what I did and I want to give you advice on what not to do. Or yeah, and vice versa. This was something I really wanted to to ask the postdocs while we have. This was sort of thrown in at the last minute, but you know, I was thinking, what was one of the things that we really wanted to do that we really wanted to do with this podcast? Well, that is realizing that there are so many common things that we all have gone through as science trainees. If we could share those struggles, share those challenges with people going through the process, maybe those people behind us could avoid some of the things that we went through. and Yeah, at least then you'll smack yourself in the forehead and say, oh, they did tell me that. I wish I had paid attention. <laughs> so what a great opportunity. I really do hope uh, if you're a grad student out there and you're thinking about going the postdoc route that you really do listen to the last episode because yep. I think some of this advice was great. And, and so let's just talk about yeah, some of it let's, now. Let's get back to the, the piece about think about what you want to do. Um, going to graduate school as a default is common, or or going to a postdoc is common, but it is certainly not the ideal. Yeah, and you're not going to find yourself in a happy place if you basically do a postdoc because you just feel like, well, I have to do something. So, so. this response was so, so uh, kind of, it stood out to me just because these are people who, when they describe what they do, they seem to love it. And yet the first thing on their mind is, hey, a lot of people go to graduate school and don't really belong there and don't really want to be there. So are they observing the people around them and they're seeing a high proportion of of kind of uh, scientists who are phoning it in because that was the, the default? Like, why is this so forward in their minds? Yeah, I mean, I think 
You know, I think in a lot of ways, this is just a question that you should be asking yourself at every stage of the game. You know, best case scenario, you should be asking yourself, is this really what I want to do and what I need to get where I want to go before you apply to graduate school? Several times while you're in graduate school, as you refine what it is you actually want to do, do I need this PhD to do that thing? And then certainly, and I think this is what some of the postdocs were getting at, when I'm choosing a postdoc, when I'm choosing to do a postdoc, do I need to do that to go where I want to go? Um, if not, then that's probably not going to be a good situation for me. Yeah, but they must be observing this in their daily life. Like if you ask me, oh, you know, what is some good advice for an up and coming data scientist? I wouldn't say to you, well, think very hard about it because a lot of people are data scientists and they hate it. You know what I mean? Like they must be seeing a lot of this for this to be the first thing that, that several of the people you interviewed said. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, from personal experience, I think it can be a nuanced situation because I can remember on the one hand being very excited for the same reasons that these guys were excited. Right. I had a lot of freedom and flexibility and I was doing science that was interesting on one level. But then at the same time, realizing that for the long term, this wasn't maybe exactly what I wanted to do. I'd been doing it for a while and certainly I loved it for a time, but it wasn't maybe what I wanted my whole life's work to be. But at the same time, I didn't know what else to do because those were most of the experiences I had were working in the lab. Yeah, it must be, you know, certainly it was my experience. You had aspects of it at different stages in the career. It must be a very, very common thing. So for every person who finds themselves exactly in the right place for their career, there are probably three or four, 10 others who are in a, uh, the right field maybe, but not the exact right position. And so um, this advice and this podcast, I think is, is for those people as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, one thing I was thinking about actually as we were as we were talking just now is, you know, if you think about it, and this went back to one of the things Fernando said that really stuck out to me, and that was that as a group, academic postdocs sometimes show a lack of imagination when thinking about their career. And the reason is because often all you've been exposed to is academic research. You've done it yourself for maybe a decade or more by the time you're a postdoc. That's the water you swim in. The people that you've seen, I guess, beyond you in the career path are mostly faculty. And so you honestly, even it, it's sort of a tough situation to be in because even if you realize this isn't satisfying to me, you don't know what else is out what there for be. you. Yeah, that's true. And, and that was very common advice. If you think you want to go teach, you know, when you're done, go teach now. If you think you want to go into industry, go find an internship or take a business class or something. It's, it's go get some experience that either validates or invalidates that, that notion that you have. Yeah. And I think that brings up another big common theme that was really important. I mean, I know we're giving advice to, to grad students and certainly the grad students should take advantage of this as well, but the postdocs also you know, certainly the research you're doing is important, but it sounded to me like as important, if not more important at that postdoc step is that you're getting the, you're taking advantage of these other opportunities beyond the lab. Yeah. I, I think this one is, it, it's a little bit telling. So the postdocs were giving this advice because they were saying, look, now I'm so busy. I don't have time to explore these things. I wish I had taken the time when I had all this free time as a graduate student. The reality is as a graduate student, you didn't feel like you had the free time either. So uh, recognize, you know, we're giving you permission. Recognize you are part of a training program. Take the time you need to get the experience you need. I don't care if you're a postdoc and you think you're busy. I don't care if you're a grad student and you think you're busy. Make the time to do it. Yeah, because those things you will look back on. If you listen to these guys, if you listen to us who have been through it as well, those extra things you do outside of the lab are going to be some of the most important things for getting that job at the next level or even being aware of who you are and what it is you want to do. Yeah, those are the nuances that make your CV interesting. When when there are 500 other people applying with the exact same CV that went through the same programs and the same step-by-step -step process, and you have that one hint that you went out on a limb and you did something you cared about because you loved it, 
people notice that and they will hire you for it. Yeah, I was, you know, one of the, the postdocs was talking about being out on the interview job, or sorry, the industry um, interview circuit. And one of the things he was lamenting was realizing that the people who are most competitive for these positions were not just the people with the most papers and knew science the best because they all had, you know, the science knowledge, but it was the people that had some experience or background or training in these other skills that were important to industry, like uh, people skills, right? Like management skills or leadership skills or opportunities doing internships, right? These would be the very things. If you think about it, let's say you have a, a potential interest or a growing interest in industry and you have an opportunity to go do an internship for a couple of weeks or a month or go attend a management or leadership workshop, you know, a couple, um, you know, a couple hours a week for a month or so, you might be very tempted to say, Oh man, I've got all these experiments. I got my dissertation coming up. There's no way I could take time to do that. But those might be the very things that get you that job that you yeah. want down the road. Or the people you meet there, maybe the people that introduce you to that job or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the comments too was, you know, you may find yourself as a postdoc, you know, you got that paper out, but you have no network. And it's really that network. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Scientists it's... never talk about networking. <laughs> so yeah, I think what you said is true. If if you guys hear anything Quorum from this, sensing I've heard about, but not <laughs> Take the time. Take the time. To, Please take the time. You, it's okay. Put the pipetters down and go go really devote some time to your career. Because remember, being a postdoc, being a grad student, that's not your job. These are training opportunities. These are steps to somewhere else. So make sure you're doing not just what you need to do to be successful where you are now. Certainly you have to do that. But do things that are going to set you up for success later on. Awesome. If you have something to contribute to this conversation, if you have some advice that, that you wish you had known as a graduate student, maybe now you're a postdoc or you're a research scientist in industry, in academia, please email us. Uh, the email address is podcast at hellophd.com. You can tweet to us at hellophd. Um, you probably do skywriting as long as it's over the, the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina area. We may be able to see it. Anyway, you can get in touch with us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, semaphore. We like semaphore. <laughs> I don't even know what that it's is. The flags with the boat. You know they. Okay, <laughs> we'll look that up. Semaphore. I'm I'm excited about this. Yeah, the, these are all big themes that I'm sure we'll revisit. Um, but you know the one the one last thing I wanted to say, and this is how we left it last time. One great thing about being a postdoc is you know it's a chance to start over. It's a chance to really take the knowledge you have. Um, you know, you've learned to be a scientist. You love science. You've got frustrations maybe from your graduate school experience. It's really a chance to reinvent yourself and, and get a fresh start. And just because you had an experience that was challenging in grad school doesn't mean that your postdoc is going to be the same way. And I loved how, how Jada phrased that. And um, I thought that was a great, great way to end the show last week. It's really good. And this is kind of the, the snapshot, the zeitgeist of 2015. I suspect, Josh, you will do these interviews regularly and we'll find out is anything changing? You know, if new funding comes forward or a new um, pay structure comes out, how will this change the the shape of postdoc training? And, and I'd like to follow it over the years. Yeah, and I hope all of you listening out there continue these conversations in your own labs, in your own departments, um, with your own faculty mentors. And, you know, together we can help to make science a better place. Let's make it better. And with that, let's move on the etymology puzzle of the week word of the week what do you uh, got dan okay so last week's clue was this wrist bone is hard-headed oh that was two weeks ago i got it was two weeks yeah revisit I've, that hopefully people can remember that long ago wrist bone is hard-headed yeah so if, if you haven't taken anatomy in the last 15 or 20 years um the wrist there are eight wrist bones and you can remember them with a simple mnemonic that you're going to love. Let's see. The wrist bone's connected to the yeah. arm bone. Several arm <laughs> bones, in fact. Uh, the, the mnemonic for wrist bones, the first initials are, she likes to poke the tall cat's head. You're, not, you're looking at me with this blank stare of like, why is he saying these words? 
Why, why do all of your mnemonics sound a little risque to me? I don't know. I learned this one, I think, in, in 11th or 12th grade. So okay. this is what they were teaching us in rural Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, so this stands for scaphoid, lunate, triquetral, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. And the answer this week was capitate. Um, this comes from the Latin word caput, meaning head. Is that where cap comes from? Like a uh, baseball cap? So many words come from this word. Um, so the, uh, the ironic piece is the winner, we actually, we had a winner this week and I can announce it on the air cause we're actually recording this after two weeks and the winner has already decided. Um, this is Kirsty from university of Wisconsin, Madison. And, uh, she got it right, but she was also selected randomly in the, in the drawing. And in her email byline, it said she was in a lab of Dr. Cappuccini. Oh, and I noticed that and I said, I replied, I said, Hey, you've got the right answer is Dr. Cappuccini's name, does it share has, a common he, root with He his, has a small head. Teeny. <laughs> no? I don't, I don't, she didn't mention that. Oh, okay. So, so she did ask. She asked Dr. Cappuccini. Um, he I'm thought, sorry, Dr. Cappuccini, if you're yeah, out there listening. Could have a very large no, head. No it's offense. Unknown. No, it's I'm unknown. sure he has a perfectly <laughs> normal size head. <laughs> it's, yes. Okay, so... Uh, she asked, and he said that he may have had a relative who was captain in the Navy. Um, also, the name may have been randomly assigned when his family came over uh, originally. But but the word captain, think about it, captain. Head. Of the ship. Very cool. Same root word. So I don't know if this is ironic or I don't know the, the correct definition of that, but I thought it was really cool that the the person answering the puzzle uh, and getting it right and winning this week is from a lab that is named for the same thing. I would call that destiny. Let me give you a couple more words. So, you know the word decapitate? I know what that means. Okay. Now you know where it comes from? I did mouse work. How about how about capital? Like the head of the... The head city of a state or a country. Um, capsize, which means, you know, a boat turns over, but it means literally to sink by the head or to turn the head. Capstone. Capstone, good call. Cabbage comes from the same word. Interesting. And with a B. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they change over time. Anyways, all of these words come from this word. Uh, so very useful to know in your, in your etymological training. Very cool, Dan. I think I learned some things. At least two things. Here's your clue for next week. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. The clue is ancient Greeks with this disease must have been thankful for their togas. They took a wide stance. While water passed right through them. Okay, that was a long one. Will you say that again? I will say it again. Ancient Greeks with this disease must have been thankful for their togas. They took a wide stance while water passed right through them. All right, so put your thinking caps on. And if you know the answer, uh, what should they do, Dan? Well, we're looking for the scientific word described by the clue. And once you get it, you'll find the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. So if you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellophd.com. And we'll randomly select a winner from the correct responses and send the lucky puzzler a gift card. And congrats again to Kirsty for getting the right answer. Yeah, we are extremely pleased. I feel like this episode was 33% porter and 66% postdoc straight talk. I like some straight talk. And I like this beer. This is good, Dan. Thanks for bringing this back. My pleasure. This this was driven back because you cannot fly with it. Well, good, good. Thank you for your sacrifice. We will be back at you next week for another installment of Hello PhD. In the meantime, happy science. We'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>